Welcome to Influential Visions. Here, we interview futuristic leaders who share their deep industry knowledge and business experience with you, ensuring you have your finger on the pulse and your eyes wide open. My name is Nathaniel Schooler, and I am your host today. How? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to see you guys. So, yeah, today I'm, I'm actually really quite happy because I'm joined with, by Sherry Hinnish from over in the States and also Deborah, Deborah Dull uh, from over there as well. And we're going to talk about the future of supply. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really quite, quite interested in what you guys are going to say, actually, in the conversation we're going to have. And yeah, so Sherry, you're the supply chain queen, you're a returning guest, you've been on my other podcast show, and um, you've recently started something called the Supply Chain Movement with Deborah over there. So what's, uh, what's that all about? Yeah, so we just started the Supply Chain Revolution, and it's basically a place for rebels people who want to be disruptive, disrupt the business as usual operating model. And we talk about all things related to supply chain 5.0, circular economy, sustainability, tech, really, really cool tech in a, in a, in a cool way. And the future of work, which includes leadership, diversity, and inclusion, all of the things that really define the pulse of business right now. And I have found the most amazing partner, Deborah, the circular nomad. Deborah, why don't you introduce yourself for everyone? <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me on today, Nat. Uh, as Sherry mentioned, we started the supply chain revolution just about a month and a half ago. And we've been so delighted by uh, the coming together of these rebels. So my background is in supply chain and operations. Um, I love this space. I tripped and fell into it during uni and I just haven't looked back since. So I love supply chain, I love the way that inventory moves around the world, and like Sherry mentioned, I love thinking about how supply chain can do good and do well. Uh, and those are really the topics that Sherry and I share together. Very cool. Woohoo! Woo! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really interested. So, first of all, I think, um, I really want to ask you, I've got a few questions. We're going to talk about how is sustainability uh, disruptive to, to the supply chain? And that's something that I'd love to hear uh, your opinions on, ladies. Yeah, so if you think about what's happening right now in the world, uh, we're really at an inflection point in our industry. And sustainability is truly disruptive because it fills an unmet need. And it's becoming a priority for investors and, cu and customers. When we think about trust and transparency and all the things that people want, technologies like, for example, blockchain and network orchestration with supply chain tech, it fills all of these unmet needs. Something as simple as, you know, this can or a Starbucks cup, people want to know, can I scan it? Where is it sourced? Was child labor involved? You know, is it compostable? All of the things that we don't know right now in the future of work in tech, all of that data and insight becomes very, very uh, relatable and transparent. So it's important because, you know, up to 80% of the spend happens in the supply chain and so do all these impacts. So we have a lot of complex opportunity to design a better world for future generations. Um, and supply chains are right at the heart of all of it. They're right in the center. Super, super. Yeah, last time we spoke, I don't think I mentioned about the Renegade Rum Distillery to you, did I? You did. I did? Yeah, because they're, they've just built this distillery in Grenada, right? And yes. it just made me think, I was just thinking of my Chianti. Chianti Classico. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just having a little drink. It's been a long day, right? And, um, you know wanted to show a bit of respect to to the Italians. And I was in the supermarket at half past six this morning and I thought, I'll buy a bottle of Chianti. <laughs> so I'm cooking a, I'm cooking a nice pasta. I've got, I've got my, my, my bolognese sauce on and everything, right? So anyhow, uh, yeah, the Renegade Rum, they're sourcing this uh, 
sugar cane from the field, yeah? So it's from field to bottle, yeah? And, and, and then bottle to consumer, right? But this, this, I know Oracle have done it already, right? They did that with some beer, didn't they? And so you can trace a bottle of beer and then they can work out which batch it was in, yeah? But I think, I, 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 I'm sort of still struggling a little bit with how the mechanics of that actually works, like from, from a, a very simple way. Like, how do you actually say well this is where it came from and this is where it's gone i think that the response so when when in general when there is a risk event your time to response can often define how effective you are in in these sorts of disruptions and we're seeing that now so when you think about provenance um or provenance depending on where you are in the world <laughs> should um, i pronounce it provenance earlier and Deborah said no it's sort of like finance in finance so <laughs> finance check out episode right. whatever is 25 minutes long of just the two of us going back and forth for reference on finance versus finance anyway <laughs> yeah well, well <laughs> so it's just think about a supply chain okay think about how many companies are involved how many nodes that's what it's called net it's called nodes in yep. in tiers Mm -hmm. I mean, you could literally have like a hundred different actors involved in a supply chain Easily. when you go from, from the customer to the field, as okay. you're describing. Yeah. So that's not the issue. The issue is people have disparate IT systems and, and they don't know where data is. It might be on someone's spreadsheet mm -hmm. in Excel. Mm -hmm. It might be, you know, maybe even now, like how do people know when they get the question where to look, if it's accurate, if the data has integrity. So blockchain, for example, because there's one source of the truth, there's one ledger, one way of working, that time to response and recovery becomes exponentially shorter. Well, I think it's interesting. Um, do we keep going if Nat's walked away? I think we do. Do we? He's muted. I'm going to pause because I'm going to say <laughs> something really interesting and I would like him to be here for this. He's back. Are He's you ready? Back. Sorry, guys. There was someone at the door. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, so anyhow, <laughs> no, I really, a I, chapter but, in your book, but you didn't really answer my question yet. So, okay. so, so when, when, when I'm in the field, yeah. Okay. Right. I'm growing. I'm gro I've, So I've got some, I've got some sugar cane. Yeah. And, and I'm growing this sugar cane, right? Every step of that journey from that product, from when, uh, let's say you grew it from like a cutting, yeah? How do you, how do you document that entire uh, process? Like that's, that's what I'm trying to ask you. It's okay, really so I'm gonna, hard. Yeah, and Can I'm gonna, gonna go. vote. You're gonna go, you're gonna go, you're gonna go. You go, you go. Thank you. Can I just cushion? Can I just cushion one thing before you start? <laughs> Okay. It's before it even gets to the blockchain. There are things that have to happen that you have to have um, sustainability and sustainable development as a core strategy in your supply chain. So you don't just show up and assume that everyone's operating, you know, ethically in the field. Like there are things that happen before it even gets to the point of entry on the blockchain. Yeah. Deborah, take it away. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to give a little shout out to our, our buddy, Sean Cooley who just wrote a super interesting book. And in that, he talks about um, the shift from the fifth to the sixth wave of technology. And why this is important is because supply chain falls along with that. So in the fifth wave, supply chain was this um, never heard from as long as everything's going fine entity in the corner back room. And we recently talked to um, Lauren Koba at Starbucks and she mentioned it as this like, we made our numbers, sales, good work, marketing, yay, supply chain. Try not to F up. And that's basically right. been the relationship between the business and the supply chain until now. And so now in less than a business generation, which I'd call six or seven years would be a business generation, it may be two, three years. Now is the expectation of complete transparency. We want to know everything about yeah. everywhere that's moving. Now, here's the secret. Supply chains don't even know where all their stuff is. So yeah, it could be a spreadsheet. It could be a piece of paper. It could be an iPhone note. This is just right. absolute truth on how these super complex supply chains are run. And so I think 
what is flabbergasting to people is in today's age of consumer uh, apps and consumer access to data, supply chains aren't as, as quick as all of our day-to-day -day items. We can't mm -hmm. turn on and off lights with our phones, for example. So we're having this transition and almost like a whiplash of going so quickly. So as we take the sugar cane clipping, et cetera, the first question is, does the sugar cane farmer know where sugar cane is, period? And there's this in-house work to be done to even understand where a single node in the chain, a single company, where their, where their items are. And this is, again, inventory is the most interesting topic on the planet. But then we add this relationship of a Deborah. chain, really a chain. It's like a web, right? It's a network. And so here's yeah. an interesting relationship that nobody ever, uh, my friend Alyosha wrote his master's thesis basically on, until you can accept that supply chain has no hierarchy, you will fail in business. Because these right. chains, no one has allegiance to anybody. Nobody reports to anybody else. They're all equal businesses. Okay. Okay. And so the idea that you owe me data because you're my supplier is one not really true and it's not handled well along these relationships but two if your supplier doesn't even have the data sorted out to begin with maybe you should be lending a helping hand to say look let's solve this problem together yeah so lots of different complex uh, ideas in there it's not as easy as can't we just put a barcode on everything okay don't get me and started on barcode types so 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 is it so so is it actually down to the barcode like it does every no i mean so like like there has to be a tracking, like, let's just have an example. I got one sure. bag of sugar cane. Yeah. Sure. And I put it in a bag. I know what day it was harvested. I know who harvested it, where they live. I know who they are and they drop it off and it goes in the tractor and then it gets to the, it gets to the door of the distillery and then it gets crushed and then it gets sure. finalized. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to talk sure. to Renegade about how they do this. Yeah. Probably. Cause I know the yeah. CEO. Yeah. So but it's like, that's what people need to understand that each stage, right, of that process is tracked and it needs to be controlled. But then there is still, there's still potential effort. There are points yeah. of fail. Yeah, there are points of failure. Right. And I think that that's sort of what we're getting to. There's a paradigm where you go from black box to glass, glass box. So where data and all of those things are held very close to the vest. In the future of work, in the future of supply chain, it truly is transparent and you can trust it. And there's integrity that's embedded and that you rely on for business decisions. And it involves human behavior. So it's not just technology, it's also people. You have to win the hearts and minds of people. You have to get them on board. And the number one question is why? What's our purpose? How does this impact us as a company you as an individual and your participation in the supply chain, you as a farmer, all of these things have, all these questions have to be understood before you actually start putting things in boxes and tracking them. Because you're right, Nat, that single point of failure in your supply chain could be someone who's like, it doesn't really matter. This doesn't yeah. affect me. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's why this is a very human thing. The future of work is human. Got it. Got it. Got it. So... Can I go one step further with that before we move on? Please. Because I think yes. it's really important to note that the item can go in the box and the item can come out of the box. Oh, yeah. And even if you inspire the people who are in your company, since you brought up food, food is one of the highest uh, rates of counterfeit and fraud through supply mm -hmm. chains. So some of that organic produce folks, sorry, not organic. Because yeah. And wine and spirits. Them, they switch Yes, it. very dangerous wine and spirits. So Especially outside because, of the United States. Just because the data is intact and trustable because it's in this unbreachable blockchain, it doesn't mean that the physical product has never been tampered with. And I think that's something really important for people to grasp that a supply chain, as long as it's a physical good, is still very much a physical place. And we have to remember that there needs to be some way of tracking that now this is a yeah. problem we've never fixed in the in the you know history of humanity right. so we're right. not going to fix it overnight but right. i want to so, call out that we can open the box again right That's yeah 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 so 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 in theory the future if it was up to us yeah futuristic thought leaders right we are 
let's be real. I was sitting it. up so all of our shirts could be seen. We Future. are. Yeah. Supply chain revolution. There you go, right? So we are, right? So it's about monitoring. It's about monitoring and it's about basically becoming more like the Chinese. And I hate to say it, but um, it, it could be a case of uh, you monitor the tractor in the field with video. You monitor the employees using facial recognition. You monitor the bags that they put the product into before it goes to the, goes to sure. the fermentation uh, vessel, yeah? And it goes on the scales and you monitor every single step of that journey. And I believe that within 10 years, maybe, could be, could be less, maybe 20 years, but it could, no, it could be less. I think five years, right? This could be a reality, yeah. I mean, Hitachi had robot warehouse managers in 2015. We know this. I said this in the last podcast we did, Sherry, yeah? And yeah. If, if Hitachi can do that, right, then we can, we can take supply chain to a full traceability, not just a, oh, I put a barcode on this bag and actually, well, my mate Johnny gave me that, like, grain and it was actually from his farm around the corner. Do you sure, know what I mean? Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. You, you're, well, you're, you're bringing this. up... Yeah, you're bringing up some good points, Nat, around um, supplier development and supplier diversity through the lens of sustainable supply chain. And there are some really interesting stats that just came out of Harvard and NYU Stern. So when businesses actually make the shift to doing well and doing good, this means doing sustainably and making a profit. On average, they see a 35% uptick in cost savings, which is... I mean, wow. who doesn't want to save money, right? Wow. <laughs> there's 29% there's improvement in supplier innovation. So when you engage upstream in your suppliers, they're actually thinking about, hey, how can we do this more effectively? Right? Or engage, don't demand. Engage, partner. Engage, partner. right. It's what we're right. doing. I right. know I'm a bit far away, but you can't see my future otherwise. Sorry. <laughs> it's trying to engage. It's not very easy, really. If you, It's my future and, on my T-shirt, you see. People can't see it if they're listening to a podcast, can they? But Sherry, I think you should turn your microphone down just a little bit because it's oh, a little okay. bit louder than Deborah. I'm um, hot. So it's hot. why, I've got a question, yeah? Why is circularity and its impact on supply chain important? Tremendous. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, so if we take this as a transition, actually, from the disruptive nature of sustainability, um, one example of why. So what we're seeing, if you are in strategic sourcing, you are already well aware of this. There are critical um, metals, elements in the planet that we are running out of. And now people can argue with this. And yes, there will still be some metal in the planet. It just becomes so difficult to get to it um, or mine through it. Mm -hmm. And so what we are finding is traditionally the last 150 years or so, we have gotten really good at making items, making them quickly. Thanks to Henry Ford. This has been amazing because we have the emergence of a middle class. This is great. Yeah. However, what, what's happening is at the end of that, what's called a linear economy, we take something out of the planet, we make something with it, we use it, and then we normally throw it away. The problem is there is more value to be squeezed out of that item that we're not getting right now. So we're literally throwing money away. You know, it's funny, I saw this meme once that said, have you ever looked around your house and seen all those items and realized those items used to be money? your money, <laughs> your money is sitting around the house. And it's the same idea is that our collective money is being thrown into landfills. Yeah. So the circular economy says, look, there's more value to be had. What if we could, instead of only in a line, make it more loopy, make more exchanges, make more, um, really place the dollar value on these materials, even if they're scraps. Um, how can we use our efficiency and innovation and technology to be able to recapture those? Cool, so that's the general concept. Now in supply chain, we know as we do value stream maps, for example, that the value is defined by the customer. So circular economy says there's more customers, more customers to define new types of value. Awesome. This has lots of impacts on supply chain. Uh, if we think about it uh, from the most, from the process physical level, I don't know uh, for everybody else on the phone, but all the supply chains I've worked on in before uh, returns or reverse logistics has always oh. been like, oh. like A the nightmare. Harry Potter room under the, under the stairs. You know, it's yes. like, 
how do I talk to returns? And they're like, Ooh, <laughs> you got to go talk to Karen. She's been here for 43 years. You know, <laughs> no, no <laughs> one's ever seen her. <laughs> right. Uh, we just know she works through all those claims collections. Yeah. So instead I predict in the next 10 years, it won't, we won't have a department called reverse logistics. That's just going to be called supply chain. And we're going to get very good at moving materials around and more importantly, actually facilitating the exchange of currency and money. One of the flows that people normally forget with supply chain, you have physical flows, you have information flows. They often forget there's financial flows that trigger all of those items from moving. Yes. The money gets super complicated with circulation. Very. But it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The pie can be bigger and each person can start to grow. The basic premise says you can make more money while paying less for new material, which is awesome. So Sherry talked about one third cost savings. The math as you work through the value to be had if you switch to a circular strategy is really tremendous. You can make more jobs, so you can employ more people uh, for less money. And right now, especially going into this time across the world, we are anticipating unprecedented levels of unemployment. Yeah. Why wouldn't we want to be able to create jobs for less money than a linear strategy would present? So yeah. my argument is that circularity or circular economy, circular business models can actually be a strategy to mitigate the disruption that is coming from sustainability, from transparency requests, from remote monitoring, like you mentioned in the last example. We do this today. We can monitor airplane engines, wind turbines. We can monitor machines yeah. from the car, and we want to fix them before they break. This is a key tenant of the circular economy. But in order to do that, we need spare parts available. Some spares take over a year to make, start to finish. And so wouldn't it behoove us to not start from the mine actually start from material that's already around. Don't take a year, take a month. So you can go faster. If you're not buying all the raw material, you can go faster, uh, it'd be cheaper. And what supply chain doesn't wanna be faster and cheaper. So there's all these great little nuggets uh, that can really allow for such a cool way of looking at the business. And I think supply chains have spent, what, 15, 20 years since we were declared a uh, discipline at finding the cost, shave out 5%, find me 10 million, we don't have much more to go down. So we have to find new levers that we can pull. And I really think that circularity is one of those big strategic levers you'll see more of in the next five years. Yeah. And customers it want it. Customers want sustainability in circular economy. Yeah. We know they this. sure do. There's a growing 100%. trend. IBM just published a study that over 70% of consumers, they want to support brands who model sustainability and who have started thinking and or embedding circular yep. thinking across their supply chain. CPG companies, for example, if they put ocean plastic on the front of a plastic bottle, they're seeing massive upticks in sales of those particular bottles. And so consumers, yeah. if given the choice, of course, of course, will choose the right uh, option if presented. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Thank you for going over the history of supply chain and mass production and, you know, it's super interesting. I, like, I come There's from like- There's more there. Hey, I know, I know. Like, I, you, like know my, <laughs> you know my background, right? My, both my, my dad and my grandfather went to MIT, right? And they both studied industrial engineering, yeah? So cool. like, that's like my, that's my that's thing, yeah? And I've worked in a factory, so like, I get, I get what you're talking about. Like, I get totally. it, yeah? Totally, totally. So, what lessons can we learn from the past of the with the with the problems we're going through now you know it, it's it's unbelievable yeah i went to the supermarket the other day there was there was there were there were no toilet rolls i mean but <laughs> but was that was that a very careful strategic play based upon them running out on purpose so that it would make people think that's the thing. Or was it just bad supply chain? Like who the hell it's panics not, about? There's a third option, mold? Matt. It's like, not yeah, there, it's not it's bad not, supply chain. It's There's not. a third option. Sherry's going to tell you about it. Okay. So when you think about something like toilet paper, <laughs> that's a commodity. Okay. That's something that you use every day. There are not ever that I can remember in my lot life on earth, a spike in the demand of toilet no, paper. No, it is a very See, steady, very right. predictable commodity. Ah. I shouldn't know this, but I do. 
the <laughs> average American um, household uses about 141 rolls of toilet paper per year. And that was based on 2018 data. Wow. So I also happen to know that between my household and my parents, we've purchased about 300 rolls of toilet paper. <gasps> no. <laughs> in two weeks. So this is the thing. You can have all the technology in the world. You can have AI, you can have demand sensing, you can have, you know, m deep sophisticated modeling, but human behavior, we are the demand signal. So if you don't understand consumer set, set, uh, trends, um, any erratic behavior, it's very hard to predict those things. And we're and crazy. We don't, so yeah, and we don't plan like, to those. <laughs> this is wait, a black wait. swan. Wait. Look, I've got, I've got a giraffe. <laughs> is this to prove that we're crazy? This is cool, right? My daughter gave me this giraffe. She's, she's eight, yeah, and she's super cool. Shout out to Maya if she's listening. And this is a giraffe, yeah? So, yeah, you're right. I can't argue with that, really. We, 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 we have, this isn't bad supply chain. This is just people, people freak out over weird things. And yeah. I think, you know, toilet paper of uh, like why not rice or beans or yeah, like right. non-perishables right you're gonna yeah. die like you've got a you've got a shower yeah yeah you're gonna totally. die but you're gonna buy toilet paper like come on yeah. Just... but i think it's interesting you know as people start to realize the phenomenon that in the back of your grocery store or wherever you buy your items it turns out there is not a mini factory of gnomes <laughs> producing your <laughs> This is shocking when people realize that, but why can't you have it right now? I had to explain to a sales team once that it was in fact physically impossible for something to get from China to Europe in four hours. That is it's physics, right? So the thing is, is there's enough toilet paper produced. It's just not physically in the store that makes yeah. stops between the factory yeah. and the shop. And so when we take a very steady state item and we put in this unbelievable, unpredicted movement, the supply chain really freaks out. And I don't mean bad supply chain. I mean, the automation on a commoditized good is very high. And so when something terribly crazy happens like that, then the, all the bells and whistles goes off. And all of a sudden, this autonomous solution needs human beings. Because it says, yeah. I have no, there is nothing in the history of time that has prepared me to make this decision. Me, AI, looking at your supply chain. Please, human, please come look. And humans are normally make the wrong choices in a supply chain anyway. And we end up with larger regularities through supply chains, which essentially means nobody knows what the truth is. And so it's really hard if you go back to remember that in a single company, knowing where your stuff is in a supply chain is actually really hard. Now try to share that if you're a retailer, try to share that up the supply chain and you're like, good, where is everything? We're out. Yeah, we're completely out. We have nothing. I, I don't know what to tell you. What's, this, what's the demand tomorrow? I have no idea. It's going to depend on a large influencer going and buying 300 rolls of toilet paper for her and her family. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Oh, you, no, you know, this is what ends up happening. You're a guilty. Show. She's guilty. Look I'm at gonna that. I'm going to argue it's not she conspiracy. It's not bad supply chain. I'm guilty. You should yeah, I mean, that. It's, it's also bullwhip too. So <laughs> I, I so don't. I'm trying to explain without calling it bullwhip she because people feel don't bad. know what that means, you know? It's okay. Bull, bull, bullwhip <laughs> is, is something that I'm, I'm good because, yeah, um, I can tell you that, well, you know, Nat, my husband's Puerto Rican, so I, I him. sent him. I love him. He's I've, so cool. He's wicked. I've been, I've been quarantined for almost two and a half weeks, and I sent him to the grocery store, and what does he come back with? You can't even make this up. These are the things that are most important for our family's survival. <laughs> Toilet paper, yeah. rice. Bean. Yeah. Barbecue sauce. <laughs> and chicken. No chicken. Oh. Chips and salsa. That's He's it. Puerto Rican. All he needs is rice and beans. Rice and beans. <laughs> That's literally all we have. And I then love like rice and the beans. sprink the sprinkle of like snacks. Oh, but, uh, I need I need to come visit you guys. I need the to snacks come, were meant to, to just get him home from the grocery store. You were never meant to see the snacks. <laughs> Correct. Uh, Correct. So, Correct. So look. We need we need to get we need to get some lessons from this, yeah. Right. What 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 are we gonna extract as 
So we've got two forces here. We've got the government who are managing crisis communications. And yeah. then we've got the retailers who are managing the communications with the government and then creating action plans, yeah, which they've come up with probably three, four, maybe six weeks ago, yeah, because yep. they knew what was happening. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work it out, yeah. If I'd have known better, I would have stayed in freaking Poland with my girlfriend, but that's another story, yeah. So anyhow, um, what are we, what are, what are we going to learn from this? So I think there are a few key takeaways when you look at the value you can create using sustainability and circular economy in your supply chain. Number one is managing risks more effectively. All right, all the external risks that happen outside of your business, all the way upstream, you mentioned in the field. I mean, it could be anywhere in your supply chain. Do you know what's happening and do you know why? Um, you also need stakeholder engagement. You can actually become more competitive by communicating and talking to other people. Go figure. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, but then there's anti-commission, there's anti-competition laws, which have been relaxed. I might add in England at the moment oh. in the UK, but so are you saying that anti-commission, uh, anti-competition laws should be like uh, changed slightly in order to uh, flex with these sorts of situations? Absolutely. But like, under but risk, like man, in risk situations, I think we have to shift. So there faster. needs to be a pre, yes, a, a different definition of what pre-competitive means. And if we keep going with toilet paper, sharing demand about toilet paper is not breaking any laws that I'm aware of. We're not talking about price fixing. We're not try price ch changing anything. We're saying everybody else sold out too. And then how do we actually make the best decisions for the community right. at the time? Right. So, so when that also comes to um, uh, food going out of date, this is a potential... Uh, for cold chain... Say, it's a, yeah, it's a potential uh, benefit of, of this. So if we did that, we could, we could actually say, oh, well, I've got this food going out of date tomorrow. My forecasted demand for um, cheese, yeah, or bread or eggs, yeah, isn't, isn't, isn't going to cut the mustard. Do you, do you, do you, do you want my, uh, my food before I throw it out, right? I mean, like, this is the kind of stuff that we could do before we then give it away to, to, to right. people who need to eat it, yeah? I think we're going to see that in the future of supply chains. We're going to see cold chain 5PL sitting on top of existing technology. It's like the layer of the layer of the layer where you can then move to inventory hubs, inventory pulling in network of networks and, and competitors will actually become customers of each other. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's good for the world. It's good for business. It enhances financial performance and environmental reduces environmental impacts well, it's race, good for right? everyone yeah you don't yeah. throw money away as much right yeah yeah and i think on that you know something that you're getting at nat is the concept of an early warning system and we we yawn and roll our eyes at this often because we're in such firefighter mentalities and when mm -hmm. are, exactly and so <laughs> now people are having disruption management meetings disaster recovery meetings risk management meetings but they don't when times are good. And this I think is the mark of a good supply chain and a wannabe good supply chain or a good supply chain professional. And a, I've been really lucky so far supply chain professional is that if you have operations in a major area that represents a huge amount of risk, China, and you didn't have a line item that just said China, and you're not reviewing that at least quarterly, then you know that this is, I'm, I'm surprised by this, right? Yes. So if we can idea, if we can really go back to basics on early warning systems, which frankly we had, somebody had, supply chains did not have, somebody had. We're often the last to know because we see the consumer behavior and reaction, but the supply chain didn't know upstream. And so the fact that we're finding out now how many people had briefings on this, how long ago, we, supply chain, we could have been in a much better position 
to not stock out or to put in buying limits or actually flex some of the levers that we have that we just didn't know early enough we needed to put in place. Yeah. So that's really a culture thing. That's really, uh, I'm in management over here and I'm not communicating with supply chain. Yeah, this is government to private business. Uh, I'm, okay. current, I'm currently throwing under the bus some of the recent okay. articles that we're seeing in America. That's okay. All. Well, we will, we will talk more about this in future episodes, I'm sure. Yeah. But, you know, I don't want to take up all your time. And I've got an appointment with this superb Chianti on my own and a lovely spaghetti bolognese i'm cooking it's been cooking for nearly two hours already yeah wow oh it's gonna be good and i'm gonna be i'm gonna be thinking about the italians right now and how beautiful they are a beautiful people yeah they are my friend my friend lives i've got two friends that live there one's an english teacher um he went to the supermarket the other day and he sent me a video back with basically it was a video of just like absolutely full shelves everywhere yeah um and he sent me another video basically complaining about how awful the english people were and how how unconsiderate they were <laughs> and actually um i hate to say it but in a lot in a few cases he's he's correct yeah because these people are idiots they buy they they, they they but they are they buy all this stuff that they don't freaking need it sits in the shelf we bought a billion pounds worth of items, a billion pounds worth of items, yeah, that are like probably not necessary. All right, all I bought was an extra bag of pasta. That's all I bought. And a Chianti. <laughs> well, no, I bought the Chianti today. The pasta I bought the other day because I was like freaking out, yeah. And I, and I went, <laughs> I was like, I need some salad, yeah. I've got to buy some salad, yeah. And I went in it, the supermarket was so busy at like 7.30 in the morning. I was just like, I'm just gonna, I'll just get out. I've got to get I out. I don't need pasta. Freaking I don't need out. salad today. Yeah. So this morning, I was just like, right, I'm getting up super early, and I went, I went, and I. To be fair, Tesco's did a very good job. I'm not gonna lie, they did a very good job. I hardly saw anyone apart from the occasional idiot that invaded my three feet space. Yeah. Ugh. Get, just get out of here and wash your hands i'm just getting ang i'm angry about i'm angry about that now you know what's crazy so where i live in maryland they have a 10 person limit in any supermarket no matter how large it is and you have to stay six feet away from the other person so there are lines that are like wrapped around the block down the street to get into like Trader Joe's or Giant or Costco or BJ's or anything like that. Oh, that's really good because it means that they're under pressure to get in and get out fast. So they're not going to bloody buy all this stuff and spend three hours thinking. Very clever. I like that idea. Nice. It's like those, remember those shows where you could have like you had like one minute to grab everything that you could. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> they were cool. <laughs> Every I episode wanted to be on that. I love that. We, you know, should, bring, we should bring that up. Yeah. We need to bring that up. Right. Well, thank you. It's been fantastic. If people want you, they just need to look for the supply chain revolution and supply chain queen and Deborah Dahl. And you're not dull, <laughs> are you really? Your name is. Well, I mean, now you tell dull, me. But you're not dull. <laughs> <laughs> oh Nat, how I've missed you. Oh, how I've missed you. <laughs> okay, and can we also say that we cut out like the first 20 minutes of our video, thankfully, because Thankfully. Yeah, well, because we don't too hot swear. for podcasting. We have a no swearing <laughs> policy on our on our, our uh, We did not realize that, and I was really devastated to learn that at the beginning of this episode. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Please make sure you share this episode with your friends and business connections too. And don't forget to drop us a review wherever you listen. Thank you.